Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Professor Azar Bouzaid, and uh, welcome. Um, I thank you all for coming. I'd like to, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight, uh, Dr. Meredith Ringel Morris. Um, Dr. Morris graduated from Stanford, got her PhD from Stanford in 2006, um, and her work was on gesture, uh, using, your, using gestures to sort of interact with massive displays, think about minority report. Um, um, Meredith has since worked on collaborative search at Microsoft Research, and her latest work uh, in the field of human-computer interaction has to do with making machines more accessible uh, for people with disabilities. Uh, in particular, today she will talk about how to help patients with ALS communicate. Um, Dr. Morris, um, sorry, um, is also a faculty member at University of Washington. Um, so with that, I'll let her go ahead and continue. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And thank you so much for, for having me here. It's, it's really a great honor and, and pleasure to come and, and visit your campus and speak with all the great people I've been meeting with today. So thank you so much for that, and especially for hosting me, Asa. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about expressive communication technologies for people with ALS. Um, and I just want to begin by acknowledging my colleagues uh, at Microsoft Research on the Enable team who contributed to this work. Uh, and I particularly want to point out the many uh, student interns who contributed to some of the projects that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, the internship program is a big part of what makes Microsoft Research a really exciting place uh, to work. It's a great opportunity for PhD students to come spend a summer or a semester uh, working on research in a, in a different kind of environment. So uh, I encourage uh, you to apply to that program if, it, if it's of interest to you, and I'd be happy to talk to you more about that afterwards. So uh, in case you're not familiar with the acronym ALS, it stands for amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, it's a neurodegenerative disease. Uh, it's relatively rare. In the United States, about one in 50,000 people have ALS. Uh, it's a condition that typically has an adult onset, uh, and you progressively lose uh, motor control. Um, Typically, the moving the eyes is one of the last things that's retained across many patients. Um, and so most patients don't have any significant cognitive impact from the disease, but because of the loss of movement, um, including in, in the vocal area, people are unable to speak or to communicate because you would also eventually lose the ability to, to type. Uh, and so eye gaze input technologies for communication are very important for this audience to be able to express themselves. Uh, you may be familiar with some uh, well-known uh, figures who uh, have or have had ALS in the United States. is often referred to as Lou Gehrig's disease uh, because of Lou Gehrig, the baseball player uh, who had this condition. Uh, and of course, many people are quite familiar with uh, the renowned physicist uh, Stephen Hawking, who has had a very unusual, very long uh, case of ALS. Uh, another uh, person, at least in the United States, who's a relatively well-known figure with ALS currently is Steve Gleason. So this is Steve Gleason. Uh, he was a professional football player in the United States, which is a, a very American football, which is a very popular uh, sport um, until his diagnosis at a relatively uh, young age in his 30s, I believe. Um, and so he now runs a charitable foundation, uh, Team Gleason, whose focus is on helping uh, give communications technology to people with ALS to improve their quality of life. Uh, he works with Microsoft quite a bit. And one of the things Steve says is until there is a medical treatment or cure for ALS, technology can be a cure uh, because of its ability to significantly improve quality of life. And so in particular, the kind of technology that I'm going to talk about, uh, we refer to by the acronym AAC, which stands for Augmentative and Alternative Communication. And in this case, I'm referring to eye gaze operated uh, AAC. So typically, you would use a, a commercial infrared eye tracker uh, to track the eyes um, as input to the computer. And you would uh, gaze at each letter on the keyboard one at a time for a set period of time. So there'd be a timeout. Um, so maybe, say, one second, you would gaze at each letter 
uh, in order to type it. And when you're finished typing, you would gaze at a play button and then your device would uh, render the speech out loud, usually in kind of a robotic voice if you've ever heard Dr. Hawking speak. And so uh, at Microsoft Research, there are two main uh, areas of research we're doing on improving the experience of using AAC. So the first is what I call improving the throughput of using AAC, and by that I mean the speed. So it is painfully slow to express yourself with one of these devices. Uh, typical uh, dwell-based uh, gaze typing, in theory, if you're, you know, you're not fatigued and the tracking and calibration is working perfectly and you don't make any mistakes while you're typing, you might be able to type around 20 words a minute. Uh, what we see when, when we observe people using these systems is typically people are typing more like five words per minute. And for comparison, conversational English speech is around 190 words a minute. So it's very, very slow to express yourself with these devices. Um, and so for that reason, one of our lines of research that I'm not going to uh, focus on in my talk today, although I can touch on it more in the Q&A if you're interested, is on improving this situation. So for example, uh, better uh, language modeling that can let us uh, maybe dynamically adjust the timeouts that you need as you are typing with your eyes or thinking about new ways that we can do better uh, text prediction for words and phrases that you might be using so that instead of typing letter by letter, you can type in larger chunks, which might help uh, speed things up. Uh, instead, uh, the other topic that we research that I'm going to focus on tonight is what I call expressive AAC. Um, and so what do I mean by expressive AAC? I mean, thinking about how uh, these devices can let people more fully communicate and more fully express uh, their meaning and their personality and their identity. Um, and so just as a bit of background for how I think about this problem and some of what got me thinking about this problem, um, I put on the left of this slide an image of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, um, Maslow was a psychologist and as part of his theory, he felt that uh, people could not um, achieve fulfillment of the needs that are at the top of his pyramid. So for example, you know, self-actualization, you know, expression, creating artwork, for example. People aren't going to be able to do that if they can't satisfy the more basic needs that are at the bottom of the pyramid. So if you're starving or you're freezing or you fear for your basic safety because you live in a, a time of war or an unsafe environment, then you're going to be fulfilled, uh, focused on fulfilling those more basic needs and you're not going to be able to get to the top of that pyramid. And I think that this is interesting to think about, particularly in the context of assistive technology, because I argue that most uh, assistive technology, both commercially available and also in the research realm, although becoming less so, is really focused on satisfying needs that are at the base of Maslow's hierarchy, um, which are important, right? So it's important, for example, that your communication technology, uh, if you have a, a severe motor and speech disability, could let you you know, request assistance in an unsafe situation or request uh, food if you were starving. So obviously that's an important need to fulfill. Uh, but it's also important to think about uh, people with disabilities as, as whole people and complete people who participate fully in society and have their own identities and needs for expression and who may wish to engage in activities from the top of the pyramid. And to think about how we can design technologies uh, that can enhance quality of life throughout this range. And so this is one of, of the motivations in helping make AAC more expressive. And so on the, the other side of the slide, this is a chart that I found um, online in a slide deck from a talk that I believe was delivered about 10 years ago at Penn State University by a man named Colin Portnuff, who was himself a person who used AAC. And this, the order is inverted from the order in Maslow's pyramid. But what it was is he was talking about the list of things that he wished his AAC device could do that it currently couldn't do. And so he begins like with the first couple items with things that I would say are kind of from the base of the hierarchy, right? So for example, he wants basic uh, compatibility and interoperability interoperability between the software he uses and other standard softwares, right? So this is kind of basic functionality stuff. 
But then when you get down to the bottom of his list of things he wants, he wishes his device allowed him to sing. And I would argue that that's talking more about uh, the top of the pyramid. And this is the kind of thing I, that I'm thinking about uh, when I think about expressivity. You know, could someone sing through their AAC device or, or other ways to express themselves? So um, the A bleh, excuse me, HCI research um, is an interesting kind of cross-disciplinary area that combines uh, skills from computer science, like prototyping new uh, algorithms and interfaces and technologies with skills from the social sciences. So uh, studying end users and really understanding their needs at different stages of the technology design process. So as part of a, an HCI process to um, explore this problem, we begin by doing a qualitative study uh, with people with ALS um, to understand better how they are currently able to really express themselves uh, through their devices and what the challenges are that they face in doing this and what their uh, desires are for uh, enhanced features in their devices. Uh, so my colleague uh, Sean Kane and I uh, conducted interviews with seven people with ALS um, and in most cases um, there was another uh, person present, like a spouse or a close friend, uh, although not in all cases. Um, and the other people occasionally um, participated in the interview as well, but the focus of the interview was really on the person with ALS. Um, as you might imagine, these are kind of difficult interviews to conduct. It's hard to interview people who are already reliant on a very low bandwidth communication technology. Uh, some of the things that we did to try to alleviate uh, that difficulty in the interview was uh, first we sent participants questions ahead of time so that if they uh, wished they could compose their answers in advance. So most of these devices will let you uh, type something out and save it to a file and then you can load it up and play it later. And people might uh, use that capability to prepare ahead of time for something lengthy they're gonna say uh, or also for something that they're gonna say over and over, like people would write you know, a story about their vacation that they knew they were gonna tell over and over and they would save it so that they didn't have to retype it every time. So we uh, would use that functionality. Um, during interviews, uh, obviously being very patient uh, is important. Uh, also people would often become fatigued or their devices would stop working. Um, so sometimes we had to break interviews into sessions or in the cases where devices stopped working, uh, which is unfortunately something that happens frequently with this kind of technology. Um, we would fall back on transforming open-ended questions into multiple choice questions um, and then um, doing things like reading each answer aloud and waiting for people to, to blink or make certain eye gestures to indicate which answer they wanted. Uh, so those are some of the strategies that we used for the interviews. Um, and for the, the curious who want to jump in and read more about this, uh, we published a paper about this at the recent CSCW conference, which you can, can download. And I'll put the URLs up again at the end. So to summarize here, I wanted to summarize three of the themes that emerged from the interviews in terms of the key expressivity challenges people faced. So the first challenge is in participating in conversations. So one issue with uh, really expressing yourself in conversations is the pacing at the level of the conversation. Because it's so difficult to type quickly, uh, it's hard to have fast comebacks. And so for example, that makes uh, expressing anger difficult. One person said, my husband wins every argument now that I'm reliant upon AAC, because they can't come back fast enough to really counter a point or argue with somebody. Uh, and several people pointed out that being funny, and telling jokes and having witty comebacks or sarcastic comebacks was really hard because of this issue with timing because timing is really key in, in being humorous. Um, another issue with pacing was pacing within an utterance itself. Um, so for example, within an individual sentence. Uh, so people felt that they couldn't control things like the, the speed that a sentence is rendered at. So a lot of these devices, you know, they'll have a settings menu and there might be one high level setting like playback speed, slow versus fast, but that would uniformly apply to everything you say. And because again of the slowness and clunkiness in operating these devices, it's not like you're gonna, you know, type half your sentence, play it at one speed, go in the settings menu, change the speed, type the other half of your sentence. That would be really difficult to do. Um, and unfortunately these devices don't really respect um, things like punctuation to, um, change the expressivity. So, you know, you might imagine that you could insert extra ellipses or extra commas or just longer spaces and that would make the device pause more, uh, but they don't actually uh, interpret uh, punctuation symbols that way. Uh, so that makes it really hard to be expressive. Also things like controlling the pitch, going 
up and down and modulating your voice, um, controlling volume, having different, again, the devices have, you know, kind of one set volume you can pick for everything, loud, quiet, but it, when people are naturally speaking, they might modulate their volume in different ways to express a point, and, and people can't do that. Um, so I just mentioned volume. Another issue with volume is, again, like anger, you can't be loud, you can't yell at people, uh, you can't whisper to have a private side conversation with just one person in a room, whatever you render is audible to everyone in the room. Um, and then another issue in conversations is uh, expressing yourself through unique pronunciation of words. So I have an example here where one participant typed this word W with like 20 O's after it, and what he was trying to do was cheer. So he was trying to go, woo! But the device just renders that as, whoa. So it doesn't, you can't do non-standard pronunciations uh, to the way that you'd like. Um, and interestingly, also people actually often have to intentionally misspell words because um, you know, the rendering of language isn't still a fully mature technology. So a lot of times the voices sound very unnatural and people have figured out that if you spell words in certain ways, they'll sound more like you want them to sound. So for example, um, one of our participants would write the word work, W-E-R-K, because he felt that that sounded better when it was rendered like audio. Uh, unfortunately, doing that actually has a couple of other problems. Uh, so I mentioned earlier, because of the slowness of these systems in typing, word prediction um, or even phrase prediction become really important for speeding you up. But if you begin to intentionally misspell words, that um, messes up the ability of the, the language model to correctly guess what you're trying to type. So now you're sacrificing uh, the speed and the ability to use the word prediction for the ability to make the pronunciation correct. Um, and of course, another issue is, again, because sometimes people will spend time composing um, longer blocks that they want to save and reuse, sometimes they want to reuse them in multiple modalities. So I might want to render my story about my vacation out loud for you to hear, and then I might also want to post it on Facebook or send it via email uh, for other friends to consume. And so now if I've misspelled words so they sound good, they'll also be misspelled in my same written communications. And that was particularly problematic for many of our participants because of stereotypes that suggest that people with um, severe physical disabilities may be less mentally capable, even though that, that, that is not uh, necessarily true, especially in this case, right? People aren't generally having any cognitive challenges, but they're very concerned about continuing to appear intelligent and competent. And so uh, by having misspellings in their text, that then is a challenge to that identity and, and not the way that they want to present themselves. So another challenge um, is in expressing really your personality through these devices. So we talk to people about what kinds of topics they discuss with their devices. And of course, some of the things that they discuss are from, uh, again, like the base of Maslow's hierarchy, right? They might discuss things, for example, related to their illness or their immediate needs. But people also talk about all sorts of topics through these devices, gardening, travel, dogs, politics, philosophy, the Star Wars movies, uh, et cetera. And I think, you know, hopefully when I, when I say that now, that sounds obvious, you know, of course, people with ALS are people with interests and they talk about those interests with their devices. Uh, but again, I think it's really important to point that out. Um, partly, again, one of the, the issues that we talked about before was the, the importance of word and phrase prediction. Um, and one of the, actually the challenges in having good word prediction on these devices is um, you know, your word prediction is only as good as the, the data set you've trained on and the corpus you've trained on. And a lot of these systems train their spelling correction on publicly available uh, corpora of language. So for example, those are often uh, databases of news articles, which don't represent the way people would speak in casual conversation uh, in terms of their grammar or what they'd speak about. And of course, ideally, it would be great to have a corpus of speech from uh, real usage of AAC devices to use as a training set um, for these. And there isn't a data set like that right now. And unfortunately, one um, project that, that personally bothers me a little bit uh, is there was a, a project a couple years ago that correctly observed that this is a problem, that it would be important to have uh, more realistic corpora of AAC speech usage. And so the way that they decided to create a corpus was instead of collecting a corpus of, of real data, they asked workers on the Amazon Mechanical Turk system 
which is an online marketplace where you can pay people small amounts of money to do small jobs, to imagine that they were someone who was disabled and relied on AAC for communication, and then type in uh, what they thought someone might say in this situation. And they collected thousands of phrases that way and made this a publicly available corpus that other researchers now use. And again, if, if you look at this corpus, as you might now guess, if you ask uh, workers on Mechanical Turk to imagine what disabled people are gonna talk about, it's all uh, base of the pyramid, right? It's, I'm, I'm cold, bring me a blanket, bring me soup, let's go to the doctor. That corpus isn't having people talk about Star Wars and the environment and philosophy. And so I think that's a problem. Uh, we actually just started a project uh, at Microsoft Research uh, at the aka.msraac URL, where we are trying now to collect a corpus um, of samples from real AAC users who are willing to contribute their data. And we're going to scrub uh, the personally identifying information out and then release it back as a public uh, data set. So hopefully over the next few months, people will be contributing data to that corpus. Uh, back to expressing your personality. Um, so again, we've already talked about uh, the voice expression a little bit, how you can't control the pitch and the volume and such dynamically. And so the fact that the voice is, is very monotonic uh, is very frustrating to people. People particularly emphasize that emotions don't come through in the speech. So sometimes uh, people were saying, you know, if they wanted to make it clear that they're feeling angry or sad or joyful, they would have to... Um, basically explicitly type that out as part of their text. So they'd say, I'm angry now, and then they'd say what they're saying, or you know, feeling excited, and then they'd say what they're saying, uh, because it doesn't come through in the rendering of the voice. Uh, one person went so far as to say that he feels that other people think that he is a less friendly person now, because his voice sounds so devoid of expression all the time. Um, Humor, again, uh, very difficult to be funny. And this was a problem for many people who identified with being funny as a core part of their pre-illness personality, right? They were the funny guy, the guy who made all the jokes, and they can't do that anymore due to the limitations of this device. Storytelling, also, a lot of people identified uh, in their pre-illness life as being you know, great storytellers. And part of storytelling for a lot of them um, is doing things, for example, like making the voices of the people in the story. So maybe they imitate celebrity voices or they imitate the voices of people in their family or even things like when they're reading books aloud to their children, they do uh, different voices for the different characters. But because the rendered voice always sounds the same, uh, that ability is, is gone. Uh, similarly, um, if people were uh, multilingual or bilingual, doing uh, code switching while you talk and mixing in bits from different languages doesn't work well on these devices. Because again, in the settings menu, you can pick like one pronunciation. Are you pronouncing like you're speaking English or are you pronouncing like you're speaking Spanish? And that pronunciation is applied to everything. So if you intermix languages, the pronunciation is going to be really off for one of them. Uh, and finally, uh, another challenge of expression through these devices is what I call interactions with the wider world, by which I mean beyond your spouse or immediate caregiver. Uh, so for example, communicating in public is really challenging uh, because everything's just rendered through your device's speakers. Everything you say uh, is for everyone in the room to hear. You can't whisper. You can't have side conversations. Um, it can be difficult to talk to non-adults. So for example, one of our participants uh, had a pet cat and his cat didn't recognize the voice rendered by his AAC as belonging to a human because it sounded robotic. So he couldn't call his cat's name and have his cat come to him anymore because uh, of this problem. Uh, people also wanted to use these devices to interact with uh, agents like uh, iPhone Siri or Amazon's Alexa. Um, to kind of have their output then be input to other voice-operated systems, which uh, they had really mixed success in getting that to work correctly. So just to, to summarize kind of some of the things that we learned from this initial study, one of the things that I think is really important is thinking about how AAC devices are evaluated. So uh, WPM is words per minute. And then that refers to the speed of communication, which is very important, right? And some of these uh, problems, like not having a snappy comeback to sound funny or to argue, are uh, related to throughput. And so throughput and words per minute are important. Uh, but some of the other issues are really important, too. Like, uh, can an AAC device express emotion um, so that someone else can infer what emotion you're trying to express without you having to explicitly tell them? Um, 
can an AAC device support uh, code switching or talking to pets or some of these other communication goals that people have? Um, and one that I think is interesting is this idea of authenticity. So uh, does it really allow you to express kind of fundamentally your authentic uh, communication style that you would have had pre-illness? Um, and so I talk about this idea of the AAC Turing test um, with my partner uh, in research, Sean Kane. We've thought about this. And what we mean by this is um, kind of having an analogy to the traditional Turing test. So in the, the traditional Turing test, Right, is an idea to test for artificial intelligence, where um, if you're in a room and you're talking to someone in another room um, over a computer channel, can you figure out if the person talking to you is actually a person or a computer? Right? And if you can't tell the difference between whether it's a live person or a computer talking to you, then that computer is intelligent by the, the definition of the Turing test. And so by the, the AAC Turing test, kind of I think the idea is you know, you're in a room and you're receiving maybe like text messages or emails um, from someone and you have to figure out, are these um, communications being sent by mediated through an AAC device or are they being generated with a more traditional communication device? And if you can't tell the difference between that those two things, then your AAC device has passed the, the AAC Turing test in terms of really being able to express yourself. Okay, so thinking about some of these needs uh, for more better expression, uh, we've developed now into the other, the fun, more computer science part of HCI, uh, some technology prototypes that begin to incorporate new interface features and interaction techniques uh, that can support some of this expressivity. Uh, and in particular, some of the things that we focused on in these initial systems was expressing emotion uh, more effectively. Um, expressing emotion and also better uh, conversational pacing. So being able to uh, have your conversational partner uh, be more aware of uh, what you're doing in the conversation um, and have them be more aware and engaged with you in the conversation, even though it's very slow for you to type. Um, and so I'll show you some of the features. And actually, this is some very new work that we just uh, wrote up and, and submitted to the, the WIST conference. So. Uh, this is a screenshot of our keyboard, um, and again, you would be using an eye tracker uh, to operate this keyboard, and you dwell on each key in order to select it, and then you would hit the play button and have the speech played out loud. And I've marked up where we've added some new keys to the keyboard. And so probably the first thing you've noticed is we've added a row that has some emoji uh, icons onto the top of the keyboard. And we do a couple different things with these emoji, and these are for more emotional expressivity. So one of the, the things we want to do, of course, if we want people to be able to add more expressivity into their speech, but because it's so slow to type with these devices, we don't want to add a lot of extra eye typing that you have to do because that would make it even more frustrating to use the device. So one of our design goals was to have as little additional uh, burden on the user as possible to kind of mac have a minimum extra input to get bang for your buck in terms of emotional expressivity. So the idea behind the emoji keys is it's only one single extra key that you have to eye type. So it's just one extra uh, eye typing, and you would put it at the end of a sentence much like a punctuation mark. And then we do all the magic for you behind the scenes. So for the first question is, you know, well, which emotions should we include uh, on our keyboard? Because again, there are a whole large range and nuance of different emotions, but we have a, a trade-off to maintain in terms of uh, screen real estate that's available to you. If you make the buttons too small, it becomes increasingly hard to hit them with the eyes, which again makes your typing more errorful and it takes longer. So we, we can't put too many on there. Um, so we chose the emotions through a combination of um, psychology research. So in psychology research, there's generally been found to be six uh, emotions that are common across all cultures in all parts of the world. So happiness, sadness, uh, fear, disgust, surprise, and I just forgot what order I said them in, but there's <laughs> anger. Um, those, are the, those are the six universal human emotions. But then there are also several emotions that in our interviews people talked about being very important to them. Um, so expressing humor was really important to people. And it was so important that we actually put in two different kinds of humor. Um, we put in uh, funny, uh, kind of more straight up humor and uh, more nuanced uh, sarcasm. Um, so we, that's how we came to the set of, of things we do. And 
what happens when you uh, use these emoji on uh, the keyboard are two different things. So the first thing is um, we, if you add an emoji to your sentence, like sad, let's say, um, behind the scenes, what we do is we take speech synthesis markup language, SSML, and it's um, you know, similar to HTML, it's a, it's a markup language that most commercial speech uh, engines recognize and respect to different degrees, much like different web browsers kind of are really close to implementing the HTML standard, but they all have different things that they do and don't do quite uh, fully. Um, and so speech synthesis markup language lets you specify things like that you want to change the um, the pitch of certain uh, words or parts of words, or you want to change the volume of certain areas or the pacing of certain areas. So um, all we ask the end user to do, again, is type a single button for the emoji, and then, again, using um, heuristics based on studies of how people naturally modulate their voice for different emotions that are already available in the literature, we um, apply a reasonable uh, set of SSML markup behind the scenes to what they've written and then that changes the way that the audio is rendered to add a little bit more emotion to it. And of course the quality of that is somewhat limited by the quality of currently available speech engines and, and how well they respect SSML, but we would expect over the next couple years as speech technology improves that again the same markup would, would result in a more and more natural rendering. So because the rendering of SSML still isn't great, the other thing that we use these emoji for is we also use them to add little clips of non-speech audio, um, like sound effects uh, at the beginning or end of the speech. So for example, uh, with the sarcastic one, we add kind of like a, uh, right, like a little scoff, or with the surprise, we add a, uh, an intake of breath, or with the, the frustration and anger, we add, uh, and we add those as little uh, bits at the beginning of the sentence, and those are actually quite effective at conveying uh, the emotion. Uh, the other, the next thing we've added, if you see uh, on the keyboard at spot C, the little button that looks like an ear, this is the listening mode, and this is to help deal with some of the conversational pacing issues. So. It's so a way to provide a quicker uh, back channel in conversations. So typically when people speak to each other, um, there's this back channel that lets me know you're involved, right? So you're making eye contact with me, you're nodding a little bit, you might make little mm -hmm, little interjections so that I know that you're engaged while I'm talking. Um, and this is one of the things that again was challenging for people with ALS because we can't type uh, comebacks and phrases quickly uh, on the fly because it's so slow. Um, it's very hard for them to stay engaged in a conversation. And so especially when there's multiple people in the room, it's often that they'll kind of drop out or become ignored because they can't keep up with the pace. So we, again, added this active listening mode with the goal of having really quick and fast ways for people to express something and stay involved. So you only need, again, a single um, eye click on a button to express yourself here. And again, here, part of the innovation is this idea of adding non-speech audio to what AAC devices can render. So we have pre-recorded um, little clips. Um, and again, right now we use these from a standard library, but you could imagine someone um, uh, who's already doing voice banking, for example, to bank clips of their own speech before they lose it. Uh, we actually suggest it could be really important to do voice banking of non-speech audio. Um, it's actually probably something that you would render in your own voice far more frequently uh, than any actual phrase in English. Um, and so some of the options we have are uh, laughter, right? Someone, someone says something funny, you can just have a, a laugh uh, quickly. We've got hmm and pfft and uh, a way to indicate that you uh, want to know more confused. It's, uh, O, like a question, O. Uh, we have the, <gasps> the sharp breath if you're surprised. Uh, we have the uh, to express frustration. We have the little, you know, the polite cough, like <clears throat> um, We have the disgust, the ugh. Um, so we have a bunch of different ones. Um, and again, when we present these um, to people with ALS, this is actually, of, of, I think, all the different things we've made, this is the, the thing that people are most excited about, um, this active listening mode. Um, and one of the things that people are, again, very interested in, it, it would be customizing this also. So either customizing it with their own voice banking of these expressions or customizing what's on the menu based on their own personalities. So you know, we have one person who's a big Simpsons fan. He wants 
dough to be one of his uh, fast responses. Uh, we had a Canadian, he wanted A to be <laughs> one of his. Um, and so being able to uh, customize these to really express the kinds of quick reactions and phrases that you would have had before your illness. Um, then the, the last part of this interface that we made is something we call the voice setting editor. Um, and this is at the opposite end of the spectrum. So the, the active listening mode and the emoji on the keyboard were all about that trade-off of you know, a very small overhead in terms of how much extra time it takes you, it's just one extra button, um, and try, kind of trying to get you some bang for the buck there. Um, this is the opposite. This is the really complex, time-consuming, expert user interface. Um, we imagine this is something that would be used rarely, but it would be used for situations that are really important, right? So when you really want to carefully craft how you're going to sound for something. And we imagine this being used more in the scenarios, um, like I mentioned earlier, where people will often invest a lot of time to asynchronously compose some text that they then imagine that they're going to play back over and over, like a favorite story they're going to retell to lots of people, or uh, something long for a special event. Uh, you know, like if your nephew is getting married and you're going to give a toast at the wedding, you know, you might spend days working on typing up this file of what you're going to say. And so if you're already going to invest that much time in writing something, then in that case, we offer a more expert interface that you can use if, if you're not satisfied with, you know, our automatic SSML markup for expressing humor or anger, here's where you can actually just get down and craft it yourself. So we've designed an interface that's designed for use with the eyes, which gives the end user uh, control over adding all that markup that they want. So you can control you know, the amount of pauses between individual words and changes in pitch and volume at, at the individual word level and where exactly you might want to add sound effects. And then you can save that um, just as a markup with your text and so that every time you would load and play that text, it would uh, include now your more uh, emotional um, and expressive rendering of that text. Uh, actually, for time, I have a video, but I just kind of described everything in the video, so I'll skip this and maybe if there's time, I'll play it back at the end. Um, so again, HCI, one of the important things is evaluating systems with real end users, and there's not always one right way to evaluate something. So often, uh, kind of triangulating multiple different kinds of evaluation is important. Uh, in this case, um, there are several different kinds of evaluations we did. Uh, part of uh, the importance of yeah, this system is making sure that people who are listening to the rendered speech can accurately figure out, uh, for example, what emotion is being expressed. So does our uh, shortcuts of the emoji and the rendering we do accurately convey the emotion? Um, so for this, we did some, um, a couple different evaluations. So we had um, the same, uh, we had sets of ambiguous phrases that were taken from, um, from corpora of ambiguous phrases that can mean different things depending um, how you say them in terms of your, your emphasis and such. Um, and then we rendered them um, with just uh, our system with using the emoji to change the rendering. We rendered them with just the status quo, uh, more monotone rendering that you typically get from these systems. And then we had uh, actors uh, read them with you know, the full range of human expression. And we had an online experiment where people would hear these different recordings and have to uh, guess which emotion is being expressed. Um, and then also compare you know, the three different ones and rate which one sounds more natural or more expressive. And as you would expect, of course, we don't come anywhere as good as the uh, real actor rendering, uh, but our, um, ours were all deemed much more uh, close to the real emotion than the, the default, the status quo. And so we'd like to see that move to be closer and closer to um, being as good as the actor. Um, and then, of course, another kind of feedback that's really important is to get feedback from um, the people with ALS who would be composing uh, speech with the system. Um, as you might imagine, again, there's lots of complexities to getting people with, um, with ALS to complete a more traditional uh, lab study where you use an interface um, for all sorts of reasons, transportation, logistics, uh, the fatigue, the ability to sit through a long uh, session. So rather than being able to do a controlled uh, study with this audience, we were able to do more qualitative studies where, for example, um, as I mentioned earlier, we're able to show the different features like on the uh, expressive keyboard or the active listening mode and get feedback about, for example, are we including the right set of emotions? Uh, are we including the right set of 
uh, fast responses, um, and kind of get estimates of the relative importance of these different features for people. So another uh, alternative or complement to so what I just described was ways that you would change kind of the audio output of the system to improve expressivity, right? So by adding in uh, the more emotional rendering or the non-speech audio. Another thing that you could do either separately or at the same time is add visual feedback. So you could add something that we call an awareness display to the AAC device, and this would be a secondary display that would be on the back of the device that would be facing the conversational partner. And you could use this display to show uh, all sorts of information. And you can imagine using the same uh, user interfaces that I just showed you, like the emoji on the keyboard or the quick response choices, but those could trigger changes in the visual content that's shown on the awareness display. And so uh, we'll be presenting some work on this at the CHI conference in a few weeks. Um, and one thing, you don't have to read all the small text on here, but what I, what I threw up here is one of the things that we spent a lot of time doing was thinking about the different design dimensions that are important in creating an awareness display. Um, so for example, um, some of the dimensions are just thinking about the practical level, like how much would this extra display cost? You could imagine making a really cheap, low cost display that's just you know, a single LED light that's on the back of your screen and maybe it just turns on and off in different patterns or shows different colors. Or you could have, you know, a full, like really high resolution um, display or even like a 3D display or something that displays like renderings of yourself captured as a 3D avatar making different facial expressions. So there's different price points, um, you know, there's different, um, and then, of course, the things like whether it's a big display or small also affect things like how uh, portable uh, the device is. So these are practical concerns that might be really important to end users. Uh, we also talk about uh, things to think about, like how abstract versus concrete the content on the display is. So you could imagine something really abstract again, like just even if I have a very high resolution display, maybe it just changes color. You know, maybe when I'm saying something and I hit the angry uh, emoji, my display is kind of red, it's just like a red glow that kind of underlines the text. And if I'm happy, it's yellow. And, and that might be different culturally specific in different locations. Uh, or maybe it's really literal. So if I'm angry and I hit that angry mode, maybe it just says like, I'm angry the whole time there. And so it's kind of subtext to what I'm rendering aloud, right? So what's the, the right uh, level of abstractness versus concreteness? And so these are some of the issues that we um, are thinking about when we design these displays. And so uh, one of the things we did was we explored uh, developing a set of these different visual um, displays that explore different points in this design space uh, from being um, low cost. So we explored one that's just an array of LEDs uh, that's represented by the little uh, circle diagrams at the bottom. So all you have are a few LEDs that can be shown in different colors or different on-off patterns uh, to having a more high resolution display, um, thinking about showing uh, abstract things like uh, nature scenes versus more concrete things like actual text and trying to then evaluate um, how uh, effective these are. And again, for evaluation, um, there's two different perspectives to evaluate from, right? So there's the perspective of the conversation partner. Can people correctly interpret, you know, what does the, the, the rain coming down the screen, you know, what emotion is that trying to convey? So can people correctly figure it out? Um, and then also from the, the point of view of people with ALS, you know, does this express them, their personality in, in the way that they want to? Uh, is this something that they would want to use to represent themselves um, and, and be expressive, or is this strange? So we evaluated several different designs for two purposes. Um, so one is for conveying emotions, uh, as we talked about before. So emotional expressivity uh, is important. And then the other is for conveying some of these more conversational pacing things, like the fact that you're kind of doing this active listening. So can you convey that, um, that you're paying attention or that you have a quick question about what someone's saying or that you need them to pause for a minute to help with these issues of conversational pacing um, so that you can stay involved? And I'll show you, actually, I'll show you here um, a video that illustrates some of the, the different designs that we're evaluating, um, and then that shows you an example of how we envision uh, these awareness displays would be used in conversation. It offers two different alternatives to communication for AAC awareness displays. Cases communication partners make them more aware of the conversational flow 
and the emotions of a person using the ABAC device. We designed six types of awareness displays to explore this design space. Related to conversational flow, the displays can communicate back description using the ABAC device to listening. So we're showing all six designs at once here. In regard to emotions, the display can show that a person using the ABAC device is happy, sad, angry. sarcastic and being caring or loving. Here are three examples of how three different displays work in the context of a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So the insight is just showing Digger uh, what she's typing. She's using her eyes to type and then um, the, the man is seeing the awareness display facing him. So you see, it's actually sometimes hard to tell when people are typing. It's useful to have this display because it's hard to tell if people are just resting or if they're actively typing or if they're trying to type and their device is malfunctioning. And so the way she's changing what's on the display is, again, using the interface I showed you earlier with the different emoji um, and the different listening mode uh, options. So she can trigger those with her eyes, and they change what's on the display. And you could imagine, and this was just showing the example with the text, but you could use any of the display types. And you could either have this alone, or you could imagine combining it with some of the, the audio reactions we showed before. So maybe you'd have the, the non-speech audio plus what's shown on the awareness display. Um, so we did some uh, different kinds of evaluation again. Uh, so one of the things that was really important was uh, display intelligibility. So can people um, who are, would be the conversation partners accurately interpret uh, the meanings of uh, these different displays? So we used this to kind of narrow down um, which um, ones we explored further. So the text, um, you know, we didn't have to test the intelligibility of the text because it's inherently self-explanatory. Um, the emoji uh, were, were pretty universally understood uh, what their meanings were, um, so we kept those ones in. But for example, the, um, the, the nature scenes were uh, often inaccurately interpreted, so we decided to, to not pursue further evaluation with those. Um, then we took kind of the most um, successful uh, ones from the first intelligibility study, so the text, the emoji, and uh, the colored, uh, the, the cheap colored display of lights. Um, and then we evaluated more uh, in a, a lab environment where we had um, someone uh, speak sort of like the conversation that you saw in the video, but not that scripted conversation, but where people would come in and they would have to converse for 20 minutes with someone who was only able to type with their eyes and they could uh, use this system while they typed with their eyes. Um, and we had the three different variants of the system and we evaluated 
how uh, effective those were. So for example, you know, if someone put up the like, I'm paused or I'm typing, like did people actually pause and wait for them or did they talk over them or did they get distracted and use their phones? And you know, how engaged did people keep it? Were people able to accurately uh, interpret and respect these meanings? So we looked into that. Um, and then in addition, we did evaluation uh, again with people with ALS, uh, where for example, we had them uh, rate and explain their own preferences for these different types of designs, um, and as well as their conversation partners, because again, the conversation partners need to interpret them. Um, what we found was that actually um, the emoji design was kind of what emerged as the, the favorite and the most effective in these studies. The text, although the text is very understandable, it was almost considered too specific, right? It didn't leave enough room for kind of nuance of interpretation. Where, so, you know, if your text just says, I'm angry, that felt very specific. Whereas people liked that uh, the angry emoji uh, cartoon, you know, it kind of left some room for interpretation. Like, well, how angry are you? Are you like super angry or a little angry or like joking? So they, they liked that it was a little more nuanced because then it could be combined with maybe what they said uh, to explain that. Um, and then people um, also really liked that emoji are really popular right now. Like everyone uses emoji, like they're really cool. Like young people use emoji. And so using emoji was actually very uh, normalizing right, and help uh, fit in more rather than being something that makes you more different and, and other and kind of like a strange technology. Um, and so that was something that really appealed to people. Although again, people like the idea of really being able to personalize. So maybe pick, again, their own custom set of emoji that might have special meanings to them and their friends. Um, like one person was telling us that he liked um, when, when he was well, he would always use this popcorn emoji like when he I am with people because it was kind of indicating like oh, I'm kind of bored and I'm like sitting like munching my popcorn while I listen to you. It had like a special meaning that he and his friends understood, right? So that's something that he would want to come up on his display. Um, and people also like the idea of mixing and matching some of these different ways of expressing themselves. So, you know, well, why should it have to be emoji for everything or colors for some things? But, but people might have their own custom mappings um, of what they want. Um, and again, this type of... Uh, idea of having an awareness display, a visual display, might change the kinds of activities people do, much like the active listening mode might now suggest that, oh, people should voice bank uh, clips of non-speech audio for use with their devices to be more expressive. Um, again, perhaps if you wanted to go with something like the high resolution display, you know, we used a computer animated avatar, but maybe people might wish to uh, video bank um, photo or video of themselves making different uh, facial expressions while they are still able to manipulate their facial expressions. And maybe some people would want to display uh, something like that. Some people might find that to be uh, creepier in the uncanny valley. But it, this kind of opens up new possibilities of things you might think about uh, for what people might want to preserve um, about themselves and how people might want to display and, and share that content to others at uh, different times. Um, so. Actually, I, I was going to wrap up here, but it looks like I have a couple extra minutes because we have a bunch of time for Q&A. So if you don't mind, actually, maybe I'll give you like a real quick one slide taste of a few of our throughput projects that I didn't talk about today. Um, so that way you'll know what you are in case um, they're in the Q&A. Um, so I'll, I'll jump back to this at the end. But uh, just again, as a quick overview, we know gaze typing um, is really slow. And so a couple of the projects that uh, we've done in this space uh, this is one that we'll be presenting at the CHI conference in a couple of weeks. Um, it's thinking about instead of dwelling for an equal amount of time on each key, right? So if I um, typically like the dwell time might be around one second. Uh, people who are good eye typers, experienced eye typers can usually do around 400 milliseconds, can get it down to about 400 milliseconds per key before they start making a lot of errors. Um, and so this dwell time is kind of one of the key things that um, is slowing you down as you type, but you need dwell as a selector uh, because a lot of people can't do things like blink on demand or have something else to be the selector. So you need the timeout. So uh, the insight in this system is that uh, the dwell time doesn't have to be constant across all keys, right? So for example, we can use language modeling to figure out, you know, if you've typed Q, U already, then maybe the letter E is highly likely, uh, but the letter G is like 
not likely at all, right? Um, and so we can make it, for example, uh, a shorter dwell time on the keys that are more likely um, and a very long dwell time on the keys that are less likely. And that's actually the most important part, it turns out, is having a really long dwell time on keys that are unlikely um, because one of the big things that slows people down is making mistakes. Because uh, these devices are not very accurate, uh, oftentimes people will, will accidentally select keys in transit to what they were selecting or nearby what they were trying to aim for. And then uh, backing out of those errors takes a really long time. And so by making it harder to select um, unlikely keys, that actually really helps speed people up because they have fewer errors to correct people later. Um, and so then in addition to taking the language model into account, we also take the layout of the keyboard into account. <clears throat> so for example, if there are several keys that are adjacent to each other, that are all somewhat likely, we might not speed them up as much as we would if they weren't right next to each other because of then this risk of hitting the wrong key. And then the other thing that's important um, and the reason we call it cascading dwell and not just dynamic dwell is the rhythm when you type is actually really uh, important to people. So we don't want to vary the dwell time between different keys too uh, much or it really throws off your typing rhythm. So we have this cascading effect where we only uh, uh, decrease the, the typing speed uh, by a certain percentage uh, each, uh, with each letter you select so that the change isn't too jarring to your rhythm. And with that, we've done a bunch of testing and this actually uh, helps uh, people type several words per minute faster. Um, and then I'll skip over to another um, Thing that we're doing, uh, we presented at the recent CSCW conference, uh, the Acrobat system. And here the idea is that it helps support faster communication and throughput by involving your communication partner in co-constructing your text. So what we do is we uh, have created a system where you can connect a smartphone to the AAC device um, and the communication partner is using the smartphone. The communication partner, um, depending on what privacy settings you set, can see what you're trying to type as you type it. And because the communication partner knows more about you and the context of what you're saying um, than any word prediction algorithm does, they can be part of the word prediction algorithm, right? So they can, um, <clears throat> while they're waiting for you, also to help keep them engaged with you and the conversation while you're taking a long time to type, while they're waiting, they can um, type in what they think might be word or phrase predictions into the app. But instead of those just being automatically like inserted into what you say, which would take away your autonomy as the speaker, what we do instead is we just insert those into um, the word prediction bar um, along with the computer generated word prediction. So what, what the partner has typed in is just one of many word predictions and then the, the end user can still decide whether they want to uh, use those predictions or not. We've also looked at having the person with the smartphone do correction of typos that are in the text as the person's typing so that the person doesn't have to waste time going back and fixing typos. So that's another way we've looked at to speed things up. Um, another one, uh, actually this work just got accepted to the DISC conference, uh, is thinking about other ways you can generate predictions. So here uh, we're thinking about now um, a lot of these AAC devices are moving to be on uh, tablet form factors and of course tablets uh, all have cameras in them already. And so we want to think about how you could use the camera in the tablet to uh, help uh, supply contextual word and phrase predictions. So a lot of times what people want to talk about are things that are physically in the environment with them, right? Maybe I want to talk about that chair because it's in the room with me or this bottle. Um, and that might not be in the language model based on what I'm already saying, but we can use computer vision technology to identify objects that are nearby uh, the user and we can add those as word predictions. So in this example, the word predictions in orange are the word predictions that are generated from the computer vision. Um, and then the word predictions in white are from the traditional language model. And so that could be another way to speed up um, sp speech. And we've looked at whether this should be used just to generate words or whether we should generate whole uh, phrases about those objects. Um, and then finally, I want to leave time for questions, but uh, another thing we've looked at, which we're also going to present at the Kai conference, is thinking about just the fact that um, gaze input technology still fundamentally like 
is, is very noisy. It, it doesn't work great. It works differently for different users. It's a very noisy input. And so we are looking at trying to measure uh, that noise in different trackers and across users and across different lighting conditions um, so that we can think about how you would design interfaces to deal with that noise. So for example, uh, what you can see from this diagram is that uh, the, the noise in the gaze tracking is different across different regions of the screen. And actually the bottom of the screen um, tends to perform worse in terms of tracking, but a lot of keyboard layouts, you know, traditional keyboard layouts have the keys at the bottom. And so what this means is it's actually harder for people to type than if you were to put the keys at the top of the screen, maybe, and only use the bottom for output rather than input. Um, so that might be a change you'd make to the interface that would give you better performance based on these insights. Um, and the last thing that I'll mention is we've also thought a little bit about um, how you can speed up input in cases where people don't have access to an eye tracker. So right now, uh, if you don't have uh, several thousand dollars to spend to buy one of these commercial systems that packages up uh, the eye tracker with all the software and the big display, um, then the alternative is the, are these low-tech uh, things called e-tran boards. And basically an e-tran board is like a big piece of transparent plastic with letters of the alphabet on it. And you would, um, your communication partner would hold it up and you would gaze at the letter that you wanted to say. And I, since I'm looking through it, I'd be like, oh, that's the letter M. I'd make my guess about what I think. Then you'd look at the next letter and we kind of spell out words that way. And as you can imagine, that's really slow. Um, even slower, and it can also be really error prone. Uh, it often takes like training on the part of the, the pair to really be able to use it well. So we've been thinking about what well, can you automate that. So you know this isn't going to be as good or as fast as if you have a commercial eye tracker system, but could you take a smartphone that everyone has um, and use the camera on the phone to recognize? Uh, some very simple eye gestures. So in this case, we just have people look up, down, left, or right, and we've created an ambiguous keyboard that just groups all the letters of the alphabet into those four directions. But because we're now on a, a device, we can uh, use, again, like statistical language models to figure out, okay, a certain sequence of gestures, there are only actually a small number of di legitimate dictionary words that you could actually be trying to spell with those gestures. And now we could show what those possible set of predicted words are to the person who's the communication partner and they can, that can make it easier for them to try to decode what someone is saying than using um, these low tech e-tran boards. So we're, that's kind of a, a speed up uh, over the low tech version of the communication. So anyway, I'll go back to the list of uh, references at the end, but that's a really quick overview of some of the different projects that we've been working on in this space. Um, and um, if you want to read more about them, uh, these uh, are the URLs for uh, research papers. You're welcome to download. And uh, we have about 15 or 20 minutes now for questions, so I'd be glad to take questions. Thank you.